We are honored today to have Jay Samet as our commencement speaker. Jay is a former senior manager for Universal, Capital, EMI, and Sony. And now he is chief executive officer of Long Beach Studios, anticipated to be the largest independent film production facility in the world. A media innovator, Samet has spent the past 25 years establishing new business models for global di digital distribution of music, video, and mobile media. As executive vice president of Sony Corporation of America, he built and ran Sony's digital initiatives. As global president of digital distribution and development for EMI, he broke new ground for the music industry with wireless, over-the-air provisioning, ringtones, streaming radio, and secure peer-to-peer -peer and subscription model business models. At Universal Studios, Samet built one of the first million-member online social networks. As a testament to his skills, Samet was invited by President Clinton to lead the White House Initiative for Education and Technology, where he spearheaded the effort to create internet access for America's schools. Samet's other charitable work has included the first internet charity auction, NBC's Tsunami Aid, and the concert for hurricane relief on MTV. He sits on the board of the USC Stevens Institute for Innovation and is a 25-year member of the Writers Guild of America with numerous feature film credits. Jay Samet is a magna cum laude graduate of UCLA. Please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, Jay Samet. Thank you, Dean, President Alexander, faculty, guests. But I'm really here to talk to you, the students. Congratulations on all that you've achieved. You have attained a diploma, expanded your minds, and expanded your credit card debt. You are now fully qualified to join the ranks of California's 4.6 million unemployed. Com Commencement addresses are supposed to be imbued with platitudes about making a difference, spreading your wings, and soaring like eagles. Inspirational polemics on the virtues of overcoming adversity and the inexhaustibility of the human spirit. The kind of motivating speech that Oprah or Obama would deliver. Unfortunately, you've got me for the next few minutes. So let me take these last moments of your undergraduate life and try my best to dispense some truth that will help you make it in the real world. Here are five invaluable tips to ease you on your way. But before you start tweeting, who is this guy? <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself. Long before I was CEO of a film studio or president of a record label, before I made hit video games or was appointed by the White House or worked with the Pope, I sat where you are now graduating from a public California university. Unbelievable. <laughs> and I remember that moment, this moment, vividly. Fifth grade led to sixth grade, high school led to college, and college led to what? Up until this point, your life has been pretty much planned out. Now there's a big what's next. I didn't have a plan. People that wanted to be doctors had a plan. I had a vague idea that I wanted to be a film writer and work in the business. I was doing stand-up comedy in college with two friends, Shane and Ed. We all wanted to be in the business, but none of us had any connections. Two girls in my dorm, Heather and Nancy, they wanted to be actresses, but none of us knew anybody. Congrats for my dorm. Um, <laughs> Out of all of us, we knew Heather would make it. Heather was drop-dead gorgeous, an 11 on a scale of 10. And just a couple years out of school, she became the first person to have two primetime television series on different networks at the same time. From Dynasty and TJ Hooker to Melrose Place and today, Heather Locklear continues in the business. But what about the rest of us average-looking folks? Nancy, for example, had the mere looks of a mortal. This leads me to my first rule of show business and entertainment. Enjoy failure. 
The arts are about following your gut and trying something new. Writing, producing, auditioning will mostly be about failure and rejection. Get used to it and accept it. You won't get every part, you won't sell every screenplay, but you will grow and learn from every new experience. So now back to Nancy. She was fearless, a great actress who made up in talent what she may have, looked, lacked, what she may have lacked in looks. She obsessed over character and voices and spent her free time working with an old retired voiceover actor perfecting her craft. She went out for everything and anything. For every rejection for a major part, success was measured by a day's work on a My Little Pony cartoon. She wasn't making it big, but she was doing what in her heart she knew she was born to do. Then one day she was called to do voiceover for a little girl's part on a pre-commercial break interstitial on a marginal TV show. A couple of lines to pay the electric bill. In reading the script, she thought the boy's role was juicier and had more character. She asked if she could read for the boy's part, and for the last 20 plus years, Nancy Cartwright has been the voice of Bart Simpson, a multi-million dollar role of a lifetime. Cowabunga dudes. Which brings me to my second axiom. Never do anything for the money unless the baby needs shoes. Your parents and grandparents have made sacrifices so that you have a chance to pursue your dreams. Don't just thank them with words. Thank them by taking a chance, believing in yourself and pursuing your craft. Now, while you don't have a mortgage and the baby doesn't need shoes, take a risk. Most of the value you have accumulated in life is locked inside your head. Your wealth is the knowledge and training and experience that you bring to your pursuits. If you fail, you have lost nothing and gained more experience. So back to me. So in college, Shane, Ed, and I started doing stand-up comedy, and we were each trying our hand at writing comedy strips. Draft after draft, pitch after pitch, Shane wrote comedies for five years without a nibble. All they want to buy are police pictures, was his lament. So finally broke, and with the desperation that comes from a beer and pizza diet, he decided to write a police action movie that was actually secretly, a buddy comedy. Shane Black's Lethal Weapon was a huge success. And three years later, Shane was the highest paid writer in the history of cinema. And what became our friend Ed? Oh, we were so jealous, Ed. Straight out of school, he got hired to be a writer in one of the top comedies at the time, The Laverne and Shirley. It had been on TV for over 175 episodes, but as fate would have it, was canceled shortly after he got the good news but he had been hired by a real TV show. And so with just that brief spark of validation, Ed kept writing without pay for over a decade. This brings us to rule number three. Only you can stop you. Fear of failure, humiliation, the humiliation of telling people that you're an actor, a director, a designer, a writer, and having them ask, what have you done? And not having an answer makes most people give up. This country was discovered by explorers and settled by settlers. Don't settle. Be a bold explorer and explore your uncharted potential. Listen to that one voice that will be with you through thick and thin, that one voice that you hear in your head that says, yes, I can. Actually, I did get that line from Obama. Anyway, <laughs> but boldly explore your soul and see what you can offer the world. Undeterred, Ed kept writing and working on his craft. His day job was just that, a day job. But his identity was always as a writer. And 15 long years of writing and rejection, now when people ask Ed Solomon, what do you write? He can answer them with pride, men in black. So, that's my friends, what about me? what I write? I wrote forgettable TV commercials, industrial films, packaging copy, video game instructions, See, I didn't listen to rule number two about the baby needing shoes. By 25, I had a wife, two kids, and a mortgage. So to pay the bills as a writer, I took any and every job I could in production. My first day on a movie set was as a technical advisor on a Blake Edwards picture called Mickey and Maud. I talked my way into a job that I was ruefully unqualified for. I knew nothing about the technology I was supposed to supervise. But I was to get $1,000 a day which was a fortune for a 22-year-old back in the 80s. Now, Blake Edwards was a brilliant director, 
but he could also be a tyrant on the set. Day one, I was petrified. I figured if I didn't say anything all morning and could make it to lunch and then get fired, I'd get 500 bucks and get fed. <laughs> that was my big show business plan, get fired after lunch. So I stood in the corner all morning, didn't introduce myself to Seoul, and when the AD announced lunch, I ran to the catering truck. I grabbed my tray and sat at the farthest table. What I didn't know was the cast is supposed to get first, fed first. So second in chow line was the star of the film, Dudley Moore. He grabbed his food and walked all the way across and sat right next to me. Now I figured I'd accidentally sat at the star table and I was getting fired. But Dudley, seeing me sitting there first, figured I must have been the producer's kid or related to somebody important at the studio, so he just started chatting away. By the time everybody else showed up, I was in the center of the inner circle, and I was golden for the rest of that picture. I am here to confess in front of you all that I was never asked to do a single thing on that picture, and I did nothing so flawlessly that the production manager hired me for his next picture down and out in Beverly Hills. <laughs> You can't make up my life, folks. <laughs> From there, I hand-painted animation cells, worked in stop motion, was a grip and a gaffer, did mechanical effects on a miniseries, directed industrials, edited commercials, made props, held the boom mic, and I even have an IMDb credit for acting. So what did I learn for all those odd production jobs? I learned I was an average writer, a lousy director, a shaky animator, a no-talent editor, a deaf sound man, a terrible electrician, and the worst actor ever to deliver lines on camera. But I also learned virtually every aspect of production and became an experienced producer that was able to deliver on time and on budget. And around this time, Universal approached my young company about creating a new thing called the LaserDisc. I had no idea what they were talking about. But when I asked if they had a budget, they said they had a big one. I said, no problem, I can do it. <laughs> this brings me to the fourth rule. Be the best at what you do or the only one doing it. <laughs> if you are unique, you are by definition the best at what you do. <laughs> by being hungry, by not being afraid to try the uncharted, I built my company into one of the top video game companies in the world, and with each new technology, CD-ROMs, the PlayStation, the internet, I reinvented myself to be the best of my craft. Now, it's easy for old people like me to look back on our successes and make it seem like life is just an elevator ride to the top. But that would be lying, because I'm editing out the hard times. What I didn't tell you is that when I graduated from UCLA, I had a full, all expenses paid scholarship to Hastings Law School at Berkeley. As a child, my mother wanted me to grow up to be a nice Jewish doctor. When I fainted at the first sight of blood, she quickly shifted her dreams and ambitions to me being a lawyer. This was my parents' dream for me. And when I decided not to go to law school and to try to make it as a writer, well, let's say we weren't close. And during my years of struggling and having the repo man come for my car and getting buried in credit card debt, I heard my mother's voice loudly saying, Jay, you could have been a lawyer. But luckily I heard my own voice. And this brings me to the final rule. The most important voice, advice I can give you today is don't waste your life living someone else's dream. You chose being an arts major, so you're halfway there. <laughs> Director Billy Wilder aptly noted, trust your own instinct. Your mistakes might as well be your own instead of someone else's. Unless you really, really believe in reincarnation, you only have one shot at life. My stories of Heather, Nancy, Shane, Ed, and I aren't tales about the ones that made it. Every one of my friends from college that didn't give up on themselves made it. So thank your professors and your families for their well-intended wishes and pursue the life you want to live. To commence is to begin. Commencement is a beginning. Class of 2010, commence with your life and fulfill your dreams. Thank you.